Welcome back to the Gauntlet, and today's competitor is Prude, Prudentialist. Uh, good, good to see you again. Likewise, Luke. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm a little under the weather, but uh, this, this is one of those things you're not meant to tell people when you're broadcasting because they never notice until you say. So it's actually kind of... People always feel like they need to apologize or sorry, my, my nose is blocked up or whatever, or I've got a scratchy throat and nobody, nobody notices. Um, before we get started, I just want to take the opportunity to remind my viewers about the Lamb of the Weekend Retreat, which is coming up on the 2nd to the 4th of August. The weekend that feels like it's a long way off, but believe me, you want to book it immediately. Get it in the diary before something else sneaks in and you, you wish that you had, uh, you wish you'd remembered to cancel your plans because uh, the Lambda Weekend Retreat is awesome. Um, it's really fun. But I think more importantly, a lot of people who've been on it have reported that it's actually been of like enormous spiritual significance to them, which I mean, praise God for that. That's very exciting. And I'm, I, you know, I'm grateful to have been a, a small part in that for some people. Um, so yeah, for many reasons, I highly recommend you email lambda.retreats at gmail.com or I think, I think I'll put a form in the description under this video so you can just go to the form and sign up directly. All right, uh, Prude, are you ready to face, face your fears, <laughs> face uh, the greatest test of uh, intellectual thinking? And uh, discover, you know, test your metal. Bring it on. <laughs> that's that's the attitude. Um, round one: music, economics, or cosmology. Oh, uh, well, let's make it interesting. I guess let's start with music. Lyrics make little impact to a song. Music is the only universal language. Or globalization has hurt music. Remember, you can you can either argue in favor or against any of these. Hmm. Uh, well, we'll take the third one. We'll go with globalization has hurt music, and we will definitely argue that that is the case. And okay, uh, I, I take it I have ten minutes or something like that to yeah, it's, make my I mean, to make my case. Yeah, it's discursive. It doesn't have to be a, a ten minute monologue. You know? Oh, good, it's good, good. I mean, and... I'm sure I could find a way to squeak out ten minutes, but I feel as if the uh, <laughs> on, on its face, it, it makes a pretty good claim. I, I feel as if globalization, as with all other modes of pop culture or cultural exports, it has uh, greatly reduced the diversity in our, our musical output the, the top 40 charts in a lot of places especially in the west has been witnessing the um a large decrease in their in, in musical variety the top 40 charts always sound very similar uh it's always promoting very similar themes the sort of materialistic hedonism of let's live like there's no tomorrow and let's not think about tomorrow um, but in the wrong kind of way, not in the Matthew six thirty three way, where tomorrow right. is tomorrow is sufficient for itself. But uh, no, it's more as if we should just embrace all of our sinfulness now and anything else like that. But additionally, the complexity of music has actually decreased in the last seventy five years. So the amount of tone shifts, the modal fluctuations inside of music, a lot of that has seen a significant decrease in our you know and we can tell you know if you were to listen to key changes and a lot how many key changes would be in music 50 years ago or even 40 years ago at the height of the 1980s you would notice that it was far more complex in their composition than there is today um there's not a lot of pioneers in a lot of uh, music sectors today you notice that you know for instance the one of my favorite bands ever is rush the canadian prog rock band did a lot of pioneering with synthesizer work and um, telling narratives within long forms of songs. And unless you're looking specifically into a folk scene or independent artists, you're not going to see too many large labels carry on uh, music in that respective way. And so when you are trying to uh, apply to the largest audience ever, which in this case, the, the globe, uh, you're going to make it as appealing to the lowest common denominator. And when the lingua franca of the world is sort of New York City or, you know, San Francisco, Esperanto English, as I like to call it, 
then all mm -hmm. of a sudden music's going to be reduced down to sort of this wet kind of solvent that applies to everything. It's just water. It doesn't have as much flavor, maybe some minerals in for taste, for color, but it's not what music used to be. And I think we can definitely tell in comparison to even at the height of the British invasion, right, of the Beatles and others in America, uh, to today, uh, music has gone culturally in a totally different direction and has reduced its quality. And unless you're looking at your local charts for local artists of your own nationality, uh, globalization has definitely hurt the music industry. Is it really fair to pick Rush? as a sort of representative of the average level of music before globalization. I don't, uh, no, I no, that. that's that's probably fair. But I think a, a point to, to make about it is, is that if you were to go back even to the 70s and 80s, that you had opportunity for a lot of musicians to be uh, experimental with their work. And a lot of experimental albums that come out are usually with, of course, established artists today. But I mean, unless... Uh, I mean, take a look at Taylor Swift's career, right? I mean, she has gone from a niche market of country music to where now she is an international pop sensation to 10 years after really she got big and she has sort of abandoned her older audience for a more global world tour let's go out and about kind of deal and her sensationalism i think has definitely been more impacted towards a global and more broad audience and so once we make the audience larger even if it's just here in the states right you're going to see um, music be reduced down to a much larger, uh, lower common denominator type deal. So if we want something, you know, it's catchy and poppy and that we can go with it, then fine. But uh, I think you lose the other qualities that make a, a good song appreciative and memorable. People will say that, fine, there's a problem with Top 40, but then just don't listen to Top 40. And in fact, fewer and fewer people are listening to Top 40 in the sense that you, 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 know, you see people online, their, their Spotify behavior is actually increasingly to find a little pocket, a niche, uh, their, their own sub-interest in music. So rather than a, there was a time, maybe, maybe, you know, as you were talking about the 60s through to the turn of the millennium, was almost a unique moment when there was a single monoculture musically, and that's um, that's what spawned groups like Rush. Actually, now people are arguably listening to a, a much more varied. Each person is part of a subculture online, not with the people who live around them. And therefore, that that small number of views means that it doesn't really contribute to getting on the top forty. The you know the uh, statistically, these are all invisible. So the the top forty stations are dominated by groups who are listened to by fewer, fewer for fewer total hours than in the past. Mm. Well, I, I think perhaps the thing to also, though, consider is, is that as a reaction to what has been, it, it's a relatively new reaction to what has been the statistical norm and sort of the market norm for, for years. I mean, let, let's consider that even in every major place of international travel, and, and at least in the United States, right, for airports everywhere, it's usually some mix of CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. The music that is over there is sometimes the elevator Muzak, right, but it's usually the pop hit station because that's what's mm -hmm. acceptable, which usually will include things like 80s, 90s, and today. And today has, well, been 20 years because of how our, our culture has been with respects to music. Yeah, but the, the sort of niche finding of, of subgroups or genres i would agree I, that, that people are doing that but they're also trying to still seek out the thing that has been sold to them by a globalization and with sort of the pop culture industry is, is that we can sell you an identity we can sell you a fandom and make that part of who you are wholesale i mean i think everyone kind of remembers the famous mark zuckerberg you know platform speech he was giving about you know turning uh, consumers into ambassadors, products and fandoms into religions and so on. And I think it's important to consider that, you know, what we might find enjoyable as well, we can find interesting music. How much of that is due to a, an algorithm designed, you know, for specific markets and individuals like on YouTube or YouTube music, Spotify does the same thing. 
And yes, they can be very good sometimes, but we also have to consider has the complexity of music decreased? Have we started turning music less into the medium itself, but more about the artist rather than their composition? Uh, outside of maybe a few famous individuals of the past, uh, and I mean early the early modern era, you know, not not antiquity, but compared to now, where it's more about the celebrity of the singer and what they do more so than the art itself, because uh, a lot of artists will do what it takes to to be noticed and to be seen rather than to create good work, and I think that is a consequence of celebrity dumb domineering the. Uh, the whole music industry itself in a lot of respect. And uh, I think that people going for smaller niche subgroups and interests, you know, you'll encounter the same thing at the early internet back in the nineties when people could, you know, find other, you know, grateful dead fans and have a website for it. They couldn't be groupies and travel with the band every, you know, other month or so. Uh, I, I do think that when we look at this broad topic as it is, right, you have uh you you see these reactions to an ongoing problem and uh, but still the the music industry itself you're right it is so varied and multifaceted but uh again that's just more ways to to export things out to the rest of the world and i think that when you can go somewhere like your country or south africa or other places and you hear americanized english being used on phone calls rather than the native dialect or or accent then that's certainly a sign that, hey, the globalization, the aspect of music, do you know who this is? That kind of uh, cult of personality and fandom, I think, certainly has hurt the, the industry. Well, I'm going to give you a nine, so you're strong out of the gate uh, in this game show. And <laughs> let's move on to round two. Would you want to talk about ethics, history, or metaphysics? Uh, let's go, let's try ethics. Creating AI that surpasses human intelligence is unethical. Ethics is fundamentally relational. Or human rights exist. If, mm. if the phrasing of these is, is ambiguous or you want to, to kind of reinterpret them, feel free. I wrote them up in a little bit of a hurry. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, let's go with... Oh, well, see, I know because I know what you do by trade. So I don't think I want to pick the first one because uh, <laughs> I don't know how I would take that one. And uh, you you would definitely have a stronger suit. But I, I think you I, and I I'd are spot if you were making uh, <laughs> false claims. Oh, you know, I'd, I'd hate to be debunked live on air. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, let's 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 go with ethics are fundamentally relational. And uh Perhaps I will I will I will take the pro on this one. Uh, and I'd like to see how you go about it because I, I'm thinking of it from a from the Christian perspective. Uh, ethics are fundamentally relational in our relationship to God. Uh, mm -hmm. obviously the the lawgiver has been uh, you know towards the old covenant. Moses had laid down the law. We have the wisdom of the law from the Deuteronical canon. Um, and of course, the patriarchs that emerged from that all in our relationship to God and his and our relationship towards uh, salvation and how to treat one another. Uh, as we know in Deuteronomy, you know, the highest commandment above all is to love the Lord thy God with all thy love, with all thy heart, all thy strength and all thy power and to treat thy neighbor and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And they add all your mind in the in the in the gospel version. The joke is, is that that's because he's preaching to the Greeks. But uh, <laughs> I just want—I love that joke so much. I, uh, I think Father Thomas Hopko is the one who said it first. I quite like it. That's very good. And uh, so I, I think that we have to consider our ethics are fundamentally relational. What is man's relationship to nature, for instance? We are, of course, commanded to be the stewards and the masters of what is on earth in that respect. So we should be ethical towards our um, treatment towards animals, uh, towards the land, and so on. So I, I think that. Our, our ethical boundaries towards the world are fundamentally relational, um, both on scale, what they're related to, and how do they relate to one another based upon a myriad of, of variables. But I would say at the, the ground level, the statement is true that ethics are fundamentally relational. Yeah, the reason this statement got in the pack in the first place is because it was said to me by somebody who's... Uh, been something of a mentor to me uh, um they well they used they used to be somebody who was was living uh in the uk and uh, now live uh, they're american they've gone back to the states um but that they, they when they said this he said it to me in um 
it was so different at the time from the way that I thought about ethics that it kind of caught me flat-footed because I was very much thinking of ethics as propositional, as a whole series of syllogisms and or train track and do you pull the lever, all this kind of stuff. Mm. And especially for me, what I was concerned about was questions like, well, shouldn't I put all of my efforts into i don't know buying malaria nets you know this kind of altruistic alpha altruism what is it effective altruism mm -hmm. line of thinking where you go oh yeah but spending all that money to improve the health of your brother is immoral because you could be saving lives um and i was kind of like what it, the argument seems pretty solid. I don't know. I don't know how to argue against it. And he said, "Well, I kind of think ethics is fundamentally about relationships." And I kind of just rolled that around in the back of my head for the next few years until I. It's now become quite central to the way that I think about right and wrong. That mm. we should act based on, in, in so many ways in life based on an understanding that it's it's people and it's, it's it's real humans and their relationships to us different types of relationships family relationships friendship relationships power relationships the history and the gestures of goodwill and the the grace that we have to live together and that a gesture to somebody who you is just a statistic or a number on a page doesn't really qualify. And, and I would, that sounds callous, but I would actually add to that, that the, the chances are, in, you know, based on a whole, I could, I could go through and list hundreds of examples of this. If you're contributing to something that is supposed to be, helping hundreds of thousands of people and you're just a, making a small contribution towards it it's probably a scam <laughs> you know not of not every time but very often the case that either deliberately or by accident then you're uh yeah you're you're not actually making wise stewardship of your resources mm. when you stop when you stop thinking about ethics as a relational matter and start thinking of it as well there's two two airs i guess you could think of it as a way as a virtue signaling situation I, actually ethics is just about people thinking i'm good or the other way is ethics is about doing the thing that somebody else is telling me is is like best mm. um well i, I think yeah. that that is a very good point to consider just because you see it's become such a meme that you'll see on, on twitter or elsewhere it's sort of the the smug you know sort of soy jack looking character and he asks well how does this affect you personally and right. and then i mean well that's a fundamentally relational question because the person who's asking that is divorced from their own relationship and situation inside of this particular moral or political or ethical quandary. Um, you know, before I was the, the the frog with being the prudentialist and everything, I had an Edmund Burke profile picture because, not because I, I find my politics very Burkean, but I believed in what he had said about our rights are inherited rights. You know, he says, who are we to make changes uh, upon the rights of others, those who have come before us and those who have yet to be born? And I think about mm. that statement very often because my relationship towards my actions, um, both in my real life, my my church life, my spiritual life, my um, even my online oh. life, you know, I, I, I think about um, I, I think about James three, you know, in that respect, uh, the teachers are to be more judged more harshly with many tongues that are said. And so, well, if I have this relationship, whether it be parasocial or just this dynamic of a talking head, you're still talking to over 25,000 people. Well, my apologies. We we just had some technical difficulties, and neither of us remember what we were in the middle of discussing. But uh, clearly, it was something about ethics. <laughs> um, yeah, we we were doing the ethics is fundamentally relational. You were just you were telling me about, about Burke. Yes, I was. Yeah, that's right. You had, you mentioned your mentor, and then I was talking about 
Burke and the inherited rights concept because uh, our ethics are relational. And I, I love that saying from Burke about inherited rights, about affecting those that have already gone before you, but how you shouldn't change the rights of those that have are, who have yet to be born. And I, I think that that's an important relationship <coughs> to have because something that I've noticed with a lot of uh, modernity and progressivism is, is that it tries to fundamentally deracinate you from that worldview. Uh, deracinate you, divorce you from history, divorce you from history in the sense that you come from a tradition, you come from a people, you come from a place. And if that's uprooted and taken away, you have no ethical obligation other than this nebulous concept of whatever the greater good is. And that to me is a, is a huge problem because then that means that you're a people without ethics, a people without a leader, a people without a God, and a people that are willing to accept anything as long as it makes those baser instincts of virtue signaling feel good well said uh now i have to give you a score i think do you know i'm going to give you 12 which is a <laughs> stonking score and partly reflects that you were interrupted and still managed to pick up and say even more excellent stuff so uh <laughs> outstanding work round three cinema and theatre world affairs or epistemology uh well i want a good score let's go with what uh, i guess i'm known for let's go with world affairs all right uh okay the first one is not actually a, that that's a bug <laughs> in my software because that's not an assertion about world theory i'll dig you up another one to choose if it, but this the second one the second one sounds like an elite theory question sure does right Right, G give me a second. Ignore the ones that are on the screen. I'll find you. Clearly you're a rare person to pick. Um... Well, we, we can go back. We could try cinema and theatre if you'd like. No, I want you to talk about world affairs, <laughs> to be honest. So uh, I'd, much rather, I'd much rather intervene. Um, but for, yes, for some reason it's broken, uh, that topic. So we've got... Uh, the West is in decline... We've mm. got uh, the two ta the two state solution is impossible in uh, the Middle East, or China is a paper tiger. Mm. What do we mean by the West? Well, I, I, my basic you, rule you, here is oh, you oh, get oh. to define the terms however you feel. <laughs> <laughs> if you pick the terms in a way, I like, that oh, makes I like sure... to, you know, I'm just, it's like asking the teacher for more explanation to the question, I suppose. And in, 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 I, in a... I can help you out if you want, but uh, I, I just want to lay down the basic rule that whatever <laughs> definition you end up picking will affect your score. Because if you ah. make your life, if you make your life easy, you know, if you if you define the terms. To be like the the West, uh, I don't know. It the West meaning America and decline meaning, um, you know, demographic or something. Oh, <laughs> that, like. that yeah, I can see what you mean in that respect. Uh, well, we'll we'll go with the two state solution because that's a pretty easy one to answer, and the the answer to that is no, that it, it's not a feasible one, uh, in in part because one, you do have the Israeli state which wishes to. Uh, as we've noticed, <laughs> at least since October 7th, um, pursue a policy that would inevitably leave them out of the picture in that territory that they are in geographically. Um, regardless of whatever your opinion may be on the state of Israel or the particular ethnic group that makes up the majority of the population of Israel, uh, it's sort of important to note that uh, both for religious reasons, uh, ethnic reasons, and sort of the greater region writ large, a, a two-state solution for, say, Israel and Palestine is not going to be as feasible uh, as they'd like, in part because the Palestinians that are there, specifically those with Hamas, Hezbollah, and other forces that are against the Israeli state and its existence, they are indirectly supported by various other state actors in the region, particularly Iran, parts of um, Lebanon, and of course, you know, some Syrians as well. Uh, on top of the fact that any refugees that are trying to get out of the area, Egypt doesn't want to take them in at all, and they've been rather adamant about not taking them in. Diplomatically speaking, it would require a substantial shift in American foreign policy towards Israel to even try and facilitate a two-state solution, um, while it is consistently trying to give 
um, you know, billions of dollars in foreign aid assistance while at the same time getting the raw end of a deal in a relationship that has led to, um, you know, countless amounts of intellectual property theft being ha happening and going to the Chinese uh, until there's a, a fundamental paradigm shift in Israeli politics, uh, American foreign aid and its uh, policy position towards Israel. Not to mention, you know, the the greater Arab world writ large or Muslim world changing its position. I, I don't see a two state solution being feasible just because uh, it has been very clear from both this conflict and numerous other conflicts in the past that it has been sort of a war of attrition. Um, you know, the, the description of an open air prison certainly seems to be very true, if not too kind to how it is in certain parts of the Gaza Strip. And then on top of the fact that uh, you know, any sort of aid that we give as the Western world to the Palestinians. Well, if you live perpetually in a siege, well, most aid always goes to the garrison first, which means the conflict will inevitably either A, restart or B, continue. So uh, until there is some kind of amelioration or actual ceasefire that isn't, you know, either side, both, you know, terrorist or otherwise, uh, going at each other's throats. I just don't see it being feasible now in the same way I don't think it was feasible back when, you know, Bill Clinton was in office. I, I have a proposed solution. I, I, I think this is a funny direction to go in with this topic because <laughs> nobody's ever, like, got a solution. But I've, I've come up with one. Tell me what you think. Okay. Uh, which is uh, you pick, a, pick an area of Germany and you just move move all the nation of Israel there <laughs> and then give, give the rest of the land back to to, to Palestine. Well, I, I feel like they would uh, be very happy with that one. I think that they would be rather to, I think they'd be happier to take Ukraine at this point than they would be uh, Germany in that respect. They'd rather have Ukraine than Germany. <laughs> well, I... They'd rather I, have I, Ukraine than uh, Israel, maybe. <laughs> well, probably. But I mean, I, I think that if you were to tell them, OK, we're going to send you back to a nation that you don't have the world's best historical relationship with. Uh, or, you know, you can rebuild Ukraine and have your own nice little place with the Black Sea and have your fight out with the Slavs. That's sort of Jewish buffer between, you know, Russia and 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 nato that's quite interesting but i had never thought of that that may be even better than my suggestion the reason i picked germany is because i'm pretty sure germany would take it right they, they are so oh i'm sure that they would right like, i de think that they denazified as they say uh, well well didn't they have some mep saying that like the, the 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 reason for existence of germany at this point is loyalty to israel or something like that like, <laughs> well, I, I feel i feel as if that they would <laughs> probably say that in some sort of ultimate uh apology world tour heaven forbid that uh something crazy happens in the Middle East and just the, the Israeli Jews were to, to go back somewhere. I, yeah, maybe Germany would offer them up. Uh, I, but at the current moment, I don't see that, that happening. I, I think that um, uh, I, I think that Israel would be trying its best to normalize relations um, as it has under, say, the Trump administration with the, the Abraham Accords. You know, you, you have a relationship between uh, Egypt and Israel from the United States you may wish to pursue that via, you know, with Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and other powers, as well as Russia, which they considerably do have. So uh, I think that whatever situation comes out of this, Israel is going to have the position of leverage. It's going to require a stronger power to be on the side of the Palestinians. And right now, I don't see that happening anytime soon as the greater geopolitical uh, racquetball gets played at the United Nations. I just find it baffling the the logic of Okay, I I kind of get the logic of we need to create a homeland for the this this people. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm just I like okay. I understand the argument that you're making, but then to go and it's gonna be over here on this patch of land, completely like nothing to do with. So let's assume that the justification is post holocaust but the middle east was not involved why do they have to host these this group and then, and then additionally there actually is quite a long history of uh muslims persecuting the jews th themselves so this is you're not even uh 
you're not even putting them next to friends, as it were. So it's it's no. kind of like it's kind of like a teacher doing the worst seating plan to try and fix a problem. <laughs> That is that's definitely true. I mean, let's and this is on top of the fact that, you know, this group had no problem with with terrorism and other militant actions to I mean, even after World War One, there was numerous bouts of uh, anti British sentiment inside of British Palestine trying to give it over to this particular group even before World War Two ever broke out. I mean, the the American um sent a, sent a, a sort of a diplomatic core there to sort of ex analyze things. They realized it was actually Presumably, really dangerous. This was a Zionist project. Yes, uh, which has been, you know, 1880s onward. I mean, it's when it really had amassed its power. And um, then you have the Sykes-Picot Treaty and how the, the lines in the sand would be drawn. And then, of course, the Balfour yeah. Declaration. And of course, that I mean, the, the thing that I left out of my comment is that there's certain interpretations of scripture that say that the end of the world will require the nation of Israel having its land back and rebuilding the temple and, and such. So there's kind of this, I think this is quite a good example of actually people's beliefs do matter. It's not, yes, it's not just, a straightforward power politics geopolitical thing like no actually... no no I, I, in fact i'm actually reading uh, a book right now called how states think rationality and foreign policy by john j mearsheimer and rosato and uh what, and i'm reading it and they're being very specific about rationality and why people have the calculus for why states or national actors do the way they do and they never really address <coughs> religion or or belief and in uh. fact People like Steven Pinker get cited all the time in this text, and you're just like, hmm. "All right, mm -hmm. John, I, I I think you need to understand that when <laughs> someone like Mike Pompeo, the former CIA, former congressman, former you know Secretary of State, has radical Christian Zionist dispensationalist beliefs, and has been on record saying his foreign policy is predicated on that, you might want to draw the line and say maybe this guy's not a rational actor." Um, but, uh, there's a great article about Whit from Whitney Webb about that very specific subject, and uh, I think it's sort of a, a good point to raise is that well, when you have some of the most powerful nation states on earth advocating for a policy that is one new, two I would argue very heretical, three very dangerous, um, considering that we are talking about nuclear armed states in a region filled with religious fervor. Maybe this isn't the world's best policy to go to, just on paper, but uh, still, as it stands, I don't think a, a two-state solution is possible. And I think that the um, even the debate inside America, right, like our, Biden's administration is fundamentally one of the most, at least demographically speaking, one of the most like Jewish administrations in the United States, but it's also one of the most anti-Israel slash Zionist uh, administrations in America. Uh, and so you see this clash between like the military industrial complex, like pro-Israel, give aid, let them, let, let them rage hell on Hamas. And then you've got like turbo progressive, you know, see, you know, DEI, critical race theory, understanding of like, actually, no, Zionism is just like white supremacist, settler colonialism. We must be good progressives, turbo Judaism, and let, let, let it have it. And so these things are clashing right before our eyes. And it's absolutely insane to watch it play out. And this sort of schizophrenia makes it all the more clear to us that such a solution is not ever going to happen. And all, I mean, also just from the state of the Palestinians, the same example America learned with Iraq and Afghanistan, you can't turn those people into functional democracies. Well, I'm giving you 13 for that because uh, <laughs> it was, you lived up to your, your expectation of uh, that, that round and uh, did exceptionally well. Psychology, elite theory, and theology. Mm. Round four. We're oh, at the halfway mark. Uh, I, I'm feeling I'm feeling bold, and I'm going to select a subject I'm actually not very strong on. But it's uh, let's let's go with theology. All right. <coughs> Here are your three assertions. God is. Oof! <laughs> you're taking on quite a lot of a lot of assertions <laughs> for the first one. <laughs> 
God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and benevolent. I don't know why I thought that was a reasonable. Uh, so you wanted to take the, to the, 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 the <laughs> table stool theodicy problem and then add a fourth one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, faith is incompatible with scientific conclusions, or God is active in the world. I feel like if we were to just talk about theology in general, we could we could get all three of these these wrapped into here. I think. Um, can we can we can we go for a hat trick, or do I have to just pick yeah? One? I'll just pick the first one <laughs> to represent that. But I'll, okay. Yes. If you can, if you could please in ten minutes talk about God's omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, <laughs> benevolence, faith's compatibility with science, and God's you know activity in your life, in in current affairs, and throughout history. Go ahead. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, I mean, the, the first one, of course, you, you threw on benevolence on, to, as we were joking, it's sort of the, the famous theodicy problem, if you can explain how God can be all three things without undercutting the other. Uh, it's sort of the, the logic problem of God, right? But, I mean, to, um, as, as you'll often hear, at least in um, the prayers in my church, you know, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, which is true of God's nature, that he is everywhere present and fillest all things. Um, he he is, of course, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, benevolent. This is not only just the traditional doctrine of God, but of course God is uh, both a merciful God who wishes not to destroy the works of his hands, but rather awaits the complete conversion of the sinner that he might return to him and live. Um, with respects to faith being incompatible with scientific conclusions, um, uh, to maybe give a, a short story, and this is sort of a more recent one, I, I think of, um, uh, I think, if, the, if, his, if I remember his name correctly, I think of St. Jonah of Adamansky, who was part of uh, Soviet Ukraine at the time, who had healed a man by his prayers. And in fact, had inspired uh, an early, you know, some of the earliest uh, scientific advancements into um, corneal transplants for eyes. There was a, a Russian gentleman who was inspired by his work and testified to that man's, um, you know, he, he had done nothing surgical. What his prayers had done was beyond the scientific consensus at the time. Uh, to a point where that man had would pioneer corneal transplants and the healing of eyes from a scientific basis, inspired by his faith and by this holy man, uh, to a point where, despite being openly, you know, a Christian in the Soviet world, you know, they they let him go on with his faith because he was one of the best in his field. Where on his tombstone to this day, you can hear or you can see on the on his tombstone the line from the the Nicene Creed: "I look for the resurrection of the dead." Uh, I. Faith is compatible with our scientific conclusions because even our most radical scientific ideas are based from uh, individuals of faith, whether you are a believer in the Big Bang theory or not. I mean, it was initially developed by a Jesuit priest who is trying to find the understanding of the world or the scientific consensus and make it compatible with the doctrines and understanding of the church. Whether you want to believe De Chardin's idea of like a Christogenesis, I, I don't think that um, not too many people would want to buy into that one, but it's uh, it's an interesting concept nonetheless. I think that uh, faith oftentimes uh, will fly in the face of scientific conclusions because faith is oftentimes more powerful than the science that we have of its day, um, whether that be via the power of prayer or um, the ability to endure sufferings and beatings and things far beyond what is physically capable of us and to do so. I mean, there are both contemporary and ancient uh, records of martyrdom that is exactly like that, that we can endure the worst of it, but our faith allows us to persevere. And of course, God is active in the world, whether it be um, if you are more of a, of a high church, say Catholic or Orthodox or Anglican position, uh, you would acknowledge that every mass or every liturgy is a theophany. Christ is very present there. God is there with you. Um, obviously, because it's A, it's body and blood. B, uh, worship is meant to bring us closer to that divide between heaven and earth. And it's there. God is active on the world. At any point in time, our own iniquity could have destroyed us. Our own evils could have brought the end of things. We've been very close to that in a lot of respects. But at the end of the day, he is active in this world and has you know, delivered us from our own tribulations and afflictions. And we have to consider when we talk about God being benevolent, we have to sort of refer to maybe the last five chapters of the book of Job 
where we might want to question why do we suffer? Why are things like this? And then God responds to us very, very authoritatively. We were not there at the beginning of the world. We are not there. We do not understand him. We are nothing more but created beings. And there are things outside of our control for us to not really comprehend God's plan or his benevolence. But um, it is important for us to consider with respects to both our faith and the world around us that uh, especially as Christians, right? You know, if if we were to be loved by the world, right? And we were to be in this world, that the world would love us. And obviously that means that we're going to deal with institutions, beliefs, and dogmas and doctrines, both scientific and secular, that tell us that, you know, the way, what we believe in is not true, but we are here for the tidings of good things to come. And those tidings of good things to come have allowed people to persevere through things that are beyond our understanding, have actually paved the way for new scientific understandings of the world. I mean, even Werner von Braun, a man responsible for NASA and a lot of scientific exploration into space, had made it very clear that, you know, God is real. And uh, his tombstone today, you know, you can look upon it, it's from the Psalter, you know, and the firmament proclaimeth his handiwork. So I think it's important to realize that God is everywhere present. He fills all things. Our faith can defy our scientific consensus of the day as it had in the past before it drives things for us and our faith and our prayers allow us for us to see that God is active in the world, both in worship and our day-to-day -day life. I think you're muted there still. Uh, uh, well, uh, that was remarkable. So remarkable that you muted me across the internet. <laughs> um, and in, in reflection of the fact that, not only did you answer one of the questions in an outstanding way, you actually are the first contestant to ever choose to answer more than one of the questions, and you, you answered all three of them within time and did a, an amazing job. So I'm going to give you 14, the highest score ever achieved in the history of the, the gauntlet. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, breaking, I hope the other um, contestants do well. <laughs> You're, you're breaking all the rules, basically. <laughs> um, okay, round five. Technology, natural sciences, or Christology? Uh, oh, well, I, t for the, for, I don't know when this will go live or when it'll be up on your channel, but today is the Feast of the Annunciation, so I, I feel as if Christology would be a good one to talk about. All right. Jesus' resurrection was more important than his ministry. Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies, or the kingdom of God is here. Hmm. 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 Interesting, all three of these questions. Uh, well, I feel like the, set, the, the, the middle one, I feel like I would just say, please read the book of Hebrews again. I, I think Paul answers that question <laughs> quite well. Um... But the the kingdom of God is here. Well, let's 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 dive into that one because I think that that's oh. interesting. Because oh, uh, I mean, John, John the forerunner and the Baptist will, will you know tells us is the same way that as he makes his way to tell others fulfilling prophecy as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, re repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh -huh. um, and many would view that as very. Uh, and, and many early Christians probably view that as very eschatological, thinking Christ would return at any time. Um, and then, of course, we have to remind ourselves, you know, a thousand, a thousand years to the Lord as his, as his yesterday as a watch in the night. But uh, I think when we think about the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God is here. Uh, you know, if you are a believer in, say, apostolic succession and tradition, you could say it, that it's not here, but a portion of it is as, as given to us at Pentecost and has been given to its great commission of, of his disciples into the world and the establishment of his church. Uh, that we have a we have a piece of it, but we look for you know, as we say in the, in the in the creed, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come, in which Christ will reign on earth, um, and in glory. But it is not here yet. But that doesn't mean that we can't prepare for it here, um, and we should be preparing for it here. And this is, of course, uh, meaning that we shouldn't be pursuing vanity. We should be pursuing the greatest commandment of them all, you know, to love, as we mentioned earlier, to love the Lord your God with all your strength, all your heart, all your mind, and to love thy neighbor as thyself, um, and to follow Christ's teachings in that respect, because he is not only the fulfillment of the law, but he is, you know, giving us the, the way to the Father, as it is in John. And we have to consider that if we want a, a, a piece of that kingdom, 
uh, it's going to have to happen here. And for, for me as an Orthodox Christian, you know, that is, of course, the church, uh, its sacraments, it's it, my, my constant prayer uh, to be as constantly in prayer as St. Paul tells us, but also to be be watchful uh, for the seasons and to be you know vigilant for what is to come because Christ could come back like a thief in the night, as he says, and we don't know when that's going to be. But um, we get a little piece of that kingdom. We, we do. I don't think it's here yet, but uh, the kingdom of God is certainly here present on earth, both in its church and in the body of Christ in which we are its members, the faithful. So we're, we're part of it. You know, we, we're to be good soldiers under Christ Jesus, as, as, um, as Paul tells Timothy. And I think that that tells us that a little piece of that kingdom is here, but it's not not here all the way. Um, I'm not uh, like I should probably clarify. I'm not a theologian. I'm not uh, I'm not a big reader on the uh, uh, either reformed or, or even my own orthodox the theologians. We really only have three. We have we have John, the evangelist, <laughs> Gregory, the theologian and St. Simeon, the new. But um, plenty of reading to tell me that, you know, God is active in the world. He's present here. This is his creation. He doesn't abandon it. So. Um, mm. but Christ hasn't returned yet. And we, we all wait mm. for that both with fear and trembling, but with joy, but, uh, we have a piece of it here on this earth. You mentioned that Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, which it turns out is actually the most common thing that he says during his ministry. It's just talking yes. about the, the, the kingdom of God coming. And I like that phrase at hand because I think it does capture, as you were saying, something of the now and not yet you know the, mm -hmm. the the presence of the kingdom of god and yet also the imminence of it that um at hand is kind of ambiguous right it, it could mean it's the thing that we can reach out and touch or it could be a thing that is like about to happen and you think but we uh, but, but, but see, it, i think it works both ways because we, we could touch it he what god was incarnate <laughs> god you know the word of god be, turned became flesh this the the mm. co-eternal of, of the father uh, the pre-eternal lamb that has been, you know, s slaughtered and sacrificed. And, and here we are, we get to witness, I mean, at least for the, the disciples in, in, in Luke chapter 10. I mean, Jesus privately tells the, the, the 12, you have, n I'm paraphrasing, but like, you have no idea how blessed you are. That you get to see the mm. thing that all these prophets and the faithful before you prayed for, asked for, never got to see. And it's you 12 and, the, you know, the 70 and everyone mm. else, the multitudes got to see. And of course we don't, but um, our our faith should be sufficient as he does as he as he tells also, Thomas after the resurrection. Yeah, and like the prophets of the Old Testament have the records of what happened. So, mm -hmm. um, like the mysteries that angels longed to look into, we get to yes. to see the answer to those mysteries. Um, there's a definition of the kingdom of God that I think is useful, mm -hmm. which is that it's the domain over which God has uh, obedience. So if you think about an earthly kingdom, it's the region of, of, of land where people will follow your commands. Um, if you think about what is the kingdom of God, you could say that within your own heart, you can make yourself a, a part of God's kingdom that ignores the geographical boundaries because in your own life god is your king and actually he supersedes the real king of the land so consequently the kingdom of god is on earth it's the church and yes we are still awaiting a day when all of creation is remade to be in full obedience to god and then mm -hmm. everything will be part of the kingdom of god but at the same time, like we, you know, we imperfectly, but when we do act faithfully, we are an instantiation of God's kingdom in the world right now. Yeah, and I mean, also, uh, you know, the Psalm, I think it's Psalm 93 or 92, uh, you know, the Lord hath become king with beauty, hath he clothed himself, he is robed in majesty, you know. <laughs> He hath established the world and it shall not be moved. I mean, clearly he is the king over all things. And we, mm. and for some reason, it's controversial to say that these days to, to, to non-Christians. But oh well, he is the king of kings. He is yeah. the chief high priest. But it is important, I think, to, I think it's a good thing to also look at as well. Because on, on one hand, of course, like we said, at hand, uh, he, the Lord was incarnate. We could touch him. We could look upon his visage. We could depict him. 
And at the same time, it is at hand because there is still more to do. And I think that that's a big reason why we see the discourse and, um, you know, the the garden, you know, the, the Olivet discourse, you know, like, when will these things be? And for one, you know, he, he tells us to be watchful for the seasons, but these things are not for us to know. Uh, we are supposed to do, I think, is what Christ tells us in the parable of the talents. The master wants to see us working. And we don't know when the kingdom itself will be at hand, when Christ will return enthroned and in glory. It could be at any moment. And that's why we should be vigilant in our in our fasting and our prayer and how we treat ourselves but and others. But also that, you know, we got to see a little bit of it in his earthly ministry. And we still get to see it, of course, in the church. We get to see it in the members of the body of Christ, the faithful, um, you know, the priesthood, all the, everyone, you know, from, from the smallest of babes to the, you know, the, 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 the bishops and so on, uh, it's all present there. So I think there is a twofold aspect of that, you know, this, this statement, like you said, um, it is here, but it's not the full thing because he's not yet come back, but we have been given a great commission by the chief high priest, by the King of Kings to do so. And, um, doesn't mean that we should be engaging in, in heretical notions of chiliasm or utopianism, but we know that the world is imperfect because of our of our fallen state. And as much as we've been delivered from death itself, there are still those that choose not to do what we're commanded to do, and that's the hell of their own creation. Um, but I, I think, yeah, the, the kingdom of God is both here, but also, as Christ said, at, at, at hand. Um, but another interpretation that I think to also consider, right, is, is that it is here, you know, because we, we we've been given the we've been given the commandment, we've been given the commission. This is what we're supposed to do. Uh, Christ said very clearly on the cross, "It is finished." Not only is the old uh, all the prophecy fulfilled, everything has been done. Um, now, of course, death will be despoiled, the devil overthrown, and now, uh, you know, and that and some people could argue that history ended when those words were said. And I think that's a, another thing to consider. That yeah, it is it is here, but it's also at hand because he hasn't returned yet after the ascension, but. It's uh, much deeper than I think we, either of us could get into for 10 minutes. That's true. Well, I, I'm going to give you a score of 11 because that was another excellent, excellent round. And uh, it brings us to the final round, literature, software and mathematics, or eschatology. Let's go with literature. Censorship of literature is dangerous. The distinction between high and low genre fiction is arbitrary or translation is impossible? Mm. Uh, let's, let's go with the last one. Let's go with translation is impossible. Because uh, that's Maybe. such a, it's a really loaded statement. And I want to say it is possible, but it's incredibly difficult. Just in, uh, I mean, a good example, right, would just simply be, uh, for a, a contemporary context, would be, say, like, translating Russian literature. Um, there are five or six different translations of the Brothers Karamazov, and I will, and you can recommend, you know, some of the more recent ones. Uh, the one that everyone most popularly knows is the original translation by Constance Garnett at the the turn of the 20th century, and it's not the best translation in the world. Um, there are better ones out there, but I mean, you still get the story and the plot across. And I think what makes the translation very difficult is, is of course, the tone of the author. The, the colloquialisms that might be used in the native language, but also, of course, um, you know, the, the background. I mean, what instance, I think what makes Dostoevsky uh, easy for us to read uh, is the fact that, of course, he references scripture and the church and liturgy very often. I, I like to, you know, for instance, at the beginning of the Brothers Karamazov, we, we learned that Theodore Pavlovich is this terrible, crappy person. When he learns that his wife had died, he says, now dost thou dismiss thy servant, O master, which, of course, is the dismissal prayer in, in a lot of church services. But it's also, you know, St. Simeon yeah. holding Christ saying, like, please, I, I've seen I've seen God. I, I'm let, now let me let me die in peace. Let me depart in peace. Um, but it is it, it's also difficult in the sense that we, we still have access to a lot of the original language, and we have scholars that can read the original Russian and tell us these things to help convey any difficulties. I mean, the New Testament is preserved and written in Greek, and we still have plenty of people who speak Greek today that can help us understand some of these terms, um, uh, which is why, of course, you have so many different translations of, of the New Testament, as well as the old. Some use the Masoretic translations, others use the um, you know, translation of the 70, the Septuagint, right, which many, uh, which I, I, I use 
uh, when I read the Old Testament is in that respect. And it gives you a, a way to look at things in a, in a sort of a holistic way. What are the differences? I have two or three intralinear Bibles and for Greek and underlining in English for, you know, the new revised standard version, the new King James and the new international version. And it lets you sort of understand where they get their certain wording from and how they uh, choose to depict their message for their specific leanings and say their denomination. The NIV is more prominent about that than the other two. But I think that it's uh, it's not impossible. It's just very difficult and it requires decades of, of, of scholarship and to understand these terms. I mean, for instance, you know, when we were on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, both the words trespasses and debt and debtors are used in the section about the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, the original Lord's Prayer has like debt and debtors, you know, when we talk about forgiveness. But then below that, of course, is about forgiving trespasses and those who, you know, trespass against us is what Christ talks about. And that's when you can see all different translations about the Lord's Prayer. The same with the Psalter. I've always been told that, you know, a good way, you know, you have a good translation of the Psalter is that Psalm 1 is blessed is the man because the man is Christ and not blessed are they. Uh, which you'll mm. see in some translations of, of, of the Psalter. And so it, it doesn't make it impossible. It just makes it very a, an act of due diligence and, and so on. I think that it becomes more complex to translate things into English when, say, you're dealing with languages that don't have a, a very good analog, which makes, of course, Russian very difficult for us English speakers to understand the same way some Japanese and Chinese texts are very difficult to understand. Um, that's why you need to have more than one translation to things. I, I have three translations of Sun Tzu's The Art of War, and our friend Semi Agog gave me two of them. He's like, you got to have more than one <laughs> translation. So uh, I, I don't think it's impossible. It's just a very difficult task. And sometimes it just requires us to accept on new verbiage, right? I mean, we don't have a word for taking pleasure at others' misfortunes, but we borrow the German one all the time. That's Schadenfreude. And it's a, it's a great word to use. So... Not impossible, but uh, certainly difficult. I, I've heard it said that the translation that's used in the New Testament, um, when they quote the Old Testament, is not a very good translation, right? So the, the Old Testament is in Hebrew, and there's a, a translation that was around at the time called the Septuagint, and mm -hmm. there are quotes in Greek, so the New, New Testament is written mostly in Greek. So there are quotes of Old Testament passages in the New Testament that are from the Septuagint. And you can argue that there are translation errors, uh, or at least slightly clunky, faulty, or, you know, it's, it's just, just imperfect uh, translation decisions. And yet we consider the New Testament to be god's word and and one of the takeaways for me from this from thinking about it is that um we can have confidence in the preservation of the meaning that god requires um in spite of what <laughs> you, you almost get into the kind of Fedora tipping atheist realm, right? Of um ah, but this, you know, combo is in a different place and therefore you uh you can't trust the Bible at all. And the the reality is that the Bible is written in a different language to a group of people in a different culture, and yet we believe that God is able to use it, you know. God's word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit. So we, I think, in the case of scripture at least, uh, can be confident that translation is an effective tool, if nothing else, then because translation was good enough for the people who wrote the New Testament <laughs> as a way to communicate God's word. Um, now, I don't know if that applies to the brothers Karamazov. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm making a limited argument here, but... Uh, I, I think it would be important to consider uh, that uh, the Septuagint is, you know, a translation, uh, you know, the Psalter according to the 70, right, for, or the Septuagint translation of the Psalter. It's, there, are, there are 
quite a few people that worked on that. I mean, uh, another mm -hmm. example, for instance, would be um, Origin, who had worked on, I believe it's known as the Hexapla. So it was, you know, looking over six different translations of scripture to see if how everything tracked and what was not, you know, what was an errant or what was um, perhaps a translation issue over the centuries. And again, I, that's why I don't think it's impossible. It's just a very difficult task. I, I consider that a lot of the Masoretic translations do come later. Um, the early church, I think, was heavily reliant on the Septuagint scripture just because Hebrew as we know it back then was not, at least with reading it, was not as prominent as, say, Greek. There was also a lot of Hellenized Jews in the area as well that uh, it was it was commonly accepted and it was the way to preach you know the old covenant towards the the greek and the gentile speaking world and uh the septuagint was very prominent and common and i wouldn't uh so it's i wouldn't say that they are faulty translations i would say that that was the translation of the proper you know i i would argue that septuagint is very much divinely inspired uh definitely a work of god there but I it's haven't looked into I, it, so you, yes. You I, might, I, you highly, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's great. Um, this is also where you get the wonky differences between, say, the Masoretic translation of the Psalter versus mm. the uh, Septuagint Psalter. Because for, for, say, someone who uses it, like the Orthodox Church, there's 151 Psalms versus 150. And it's around, mm. I think, it, it's Psalm 9 and 10 get uh, changed, or they're not changed, but how it's translated, that becomes the where we start dividing. So, like, for instance... Psalm 50 for me is have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy. Whereas I think that's Psalm 51 for most translations. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, this is part of it, but I would highly recommend it. Plus there's some great deuteronical or deuterocanonical books in the old Testament that are in the Septuagint that you would love. I think that you would love the wisdom of Sirach, for instance, I consider that Ecclesiastes on steroids. It's really good. Oh, wow. That sounds cool. I, I have done streams in the past on some of the deuterocanonical books. Um, uh, we de we definitely did uh, Judith. I think I've done uh, something on. Uh, I can't remember. I'll have to go through my back catalog. But yes, uh, if you another another you one. Fancy... I'd rec another uh, maybe we can talk about it we, in the future stream. Yeah, but I would really okay. I would really recommend uh, the Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, that's another great one, uh, especially the second chapter of Wisdom of Solomon, because that's one of the most Christological passages I've ever read. Well, that sounds like a good double billing of wisdom literature from from the Deuteronomy. Or maybe it's maybe it's better to have two two different streams. But yeah, I'd love to have love to have that as a longer conversation on yeah, Bible studies at some point. Um, but as for as for today's stream, uh, we have reached time, and uh, I think you uh, you did fantastically on that round as well. So I'm going to give you twelve. Let's go to the scoreboard, and if I hit refresh, we'll see where you've come. Not only at the top, but quite substantially <laughs> higher than anybody else. Um, so, absolutely incredible performance, Prude. Well, I wouldn't be you. surprised if you end up uh, winning, winning the gauntlet in the end. I've still got, mm. I've still got a few, quite a few guests left to go, but uh, I mean. Look, you've you've cleared the previous. Uh, hang on, I'm sure there was somebody who tied with Morgoth. <laughs> Maybe people are falling out of my data set somehow. Oh no, that would be unfortunate. <laughs> because I just had Auron on, and he uh, he got. I didn't see him on well. the list. No. Huh. Oh well, <laughs> I guess I'll have to add him back in manually. Oh, that's probably because of our technical difficulties. Uh, that may be the case. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for joining me, Prude. Thank you so much, Luke. It was a lot of fun.